welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our CPR series looks at certain topics that come up in life, and we attempt to discuss them in a way that relates to everyone. At times, we bring in the arguments of those opposed to the Word of God in order to practice contending for the faith that God gave His church. It is our prayer that you will be equipped to give a defense for the truths of the Christian faith with humility and respect. Welcome back to our Burden and Blessing podcast. We are starting up a series here on the Christian life and politics, and it's going to be probably about a four-part series. Uh, I'm Pastor Mark Tiefel, and joining me on this series is Pastor Nathaniel Mayhew. With the current political climate in the United States and many of the topics in our lives as Christians that touch on political themes, how should a Christian who is both biblical and confessional approach the topic of politics in our modern day. That's what we're going to try to dig into with this podcast series. Uh, welcome, Nathaniel. I'm looking forward to discussing this with you as we move forward here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to digging into this too, Mark. Our first podcast on the topic here is going to be on the topic of the two kingdoms, the doctrine of the two kingdoms. And that doctrine is a, a biblical doctrine and one that was developed in Lutheran theology quite extensively. Now, I'm just going to start there, uh, Nathaniel, with that doctrine of the two kingdoms. What is it and where is it found in Scripture? Well, there's a, there's a couple of places where you can find this idea of the two kingdoms in Scripture. I mean, it's, it's all over, both in the Old and the New Testament. I'm going to start with probably one of the more familiar passages that people have heard and probably have quoted over and over again in, in their lives, and that's from the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, uh, Jesus prays for his disciples, and he, he says, They are in the world, but I pray that they would not be of the world so he says you know they're they're a part of this world i i have i have redeemed them to myself so so they are mine i've called them out of this world and yet i've sent them into the world in order to be my witnesses so that verse by itself it kind of describes this this strange paradox for the christian that the christian is part of two kingdoms both the spiritual kingdom being redeemed by Christ and being his, uh, saved, reserved for heaven, but also living in this world that is full of sin, that is full of, of corruption, and, and we have to be in the world and yet not of the world. Now, there's a lot of other passages that we also find in Scripture that, that kind of, it highlights how that is to take place. So, for example, you think of Paul's words in Philippians chapter 3, where, where Paul tells us that we are, are citizens of, of the kingdom of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. But then Peter talks about these different roles that we have here in this earthly life of how we live out our lives as husbands and wives, as children, as parents, as workers, all of these different roles that God has given to us, we live in the world. And so here's the way that I like to describe it, Mark. When we talk about the fifth commandment, we talk about our time of grace. God has given to us this time, this life on this earth so that we might come to know him so that when we die, we are we're members of his kingdom in heaven. That's that's why God gives us life here in this earth. But here, here's an interesting thing. If that was the only purpose for our life, then as soon as you were brought to faith, when you were baptized or before you were baptized, God could snap his finger, take you to heaven, and there you are. You have received that gift for which he desires you to have life. But he doesn't do that. He gives you ongoing life here in this earth. And the question is, why? And that's because we live not just in the spiritual realm, but also in the secular realm. That he desires for you to be part of also the secular kingdom, bearing witness and living out your life as an example to those around you, giving to those who are around you, witnessing to those who are around you. And so there's that, that combination of where the, the spiritual and the secular or the sacred and the secular come together and how the Christian is a part of both kingdoms to two kingdoms at the same time. So the two kingdoms doctrine in Christian and Lutheran theology is pretty similar to what many people know as the separation of church and state. 
but at the same time one of the things we recognize with the two kingdoms is that each kingdom sort of affects the other in different ways and there can be at times a tendency for both Christians and non-Christians to cross over between those two realms and that's where we get into some tricky topics and so the reason we started with the two kingdoms there as you appropriately explained is because God talks about both of those aspects in his word and God says that a believer while living here on earth will be a member of both of those kingdoms in different ways and so to navigate faith and politics we have to really start from that premise of understanding those two kingdoms and I think you and I would both agree Nathaniel that one of the reasons that people struggle today with political topics so much is because we don't always keep that distinction clear even in our own minds of the doctrine of the two kingdoms now moving on to our second thought here building off of that of what we established there with the two kingdoms we obviously talk about culture as well and and christianity and our culture being part of this political spiritual divide working from that premise of the two kingdom theology what are basically the three places a person can end up when they take their Christianity and their culture and see the two intersect? What are the three reactions to Christianity and culture when we put these parts together? Well, like you said, the, the big question for not just the, the unbelieving world, but also the believing world is how or what is the relationship between Christianity and, and culture, right? And, and, and what what impact do they have on one another? You you rightly characterize the, the summary as the separation between church and state. Now, there's a lot of baggage with that terminology. What does that mean exactly? But when we, when we seek to answer that question, there are three different places that a person can end up. The first is, is what we might call a liberal theology. And a liberal theology is trying to change Christianity to fit the culture in which it, it is, is, is living. So in that case, the, the tension between Christianity and culture, culture wins that battle. And it manipulates Christianity into becoming conformed to the culture. So there's your, your, first, your first answer to how do these two things fit together. The second is what we would call social theology. And, and basically, social theology is when the church forsakes its responsibility as the church in pro proclaiming the gospel, and it becomes a social activist group. So it desires then to conform culture to Christianity, and that doesn't work either. Now, we're going to find a balance with that social theology, but the, the real problem here is when the church neglects its primary responsibility, and that is the preaching of the gospel for social activism. Well, the church, in, in option number two there, the church is trying to change the culture by that, but it's actually, like you said, becoming more like the culture when it does that. <laughs> right. So it, it starts off with, a, with a, I think, a correct a sort of correct premise, but by by focusing so much on the social activism, it loses sight of what its actual purpose is. And you're right, the church ends up becoming not the church. And if the church isn't doing what the church is supposed to do, we know that the, the secular world is not. You know, who's going to preach Christ if the church isn't? And we kind of see that today with many of the churches in our world today, that that's exactly what they have become, are, the, are these social activist groups, and they are no longer the church. They are no longer what they are called to be by, by Christ. Now there's a there's a third one also, and we don't see this quite as often in our in our society today, but it has been very prevalent in in history, and that's what we would call hermit theology. So this individual says, "Hey, I don't I don't want to be a part of the culture because I have these Christian values. So if and if I go out in the culture, I'm going to become like the culture. So the only solution then for me is to go into hiding." To hibernation and to say I don't want to be a part of the culture at all the problem with hermit theology is that you're not doing what Christ has called us to do and that is to be a light to the world how can you do that if you're you're locked away you know in a monastery somewhere or you know you have you've you've kind of pulled yourself out of society completely mm -hmm. so those are the, the three different responses the three major responses to this question how does Christianity and culture how do they come together? Where where do they operate together, and how does that function? 
Yep. And what you see in each of those three reactions that you mentioned is they take it and they make it an either or. Either you've got to have Christianity or what what you might say many today define as Christianity, or you've got to have culture. You've got to make it an either or. The doctrine of the two kingdoms is really the only reaction that takes it as an and. You can take both of them in Correct. the appropriate way. But what that means then for the Christian is keeping separate what the culture is and your and your role in the culture and what your faith is and your role in your faith and, and what the purpose of each is in your life. The Bible doesn't despise culture. No. The Bible celebrates culture. The Bible says that it's par part of the gift that God gives, right? But to understand that it's not the same as our spiritual lives or as our faith, keeping those two things separate is really the whole point of the doctrine of the two kingdoms. So it doesn't make it an either or, but it tries to take both in its appropriate stance. What now, I, move. I think, well, I think it's imp important to understand too that throughout the course of of the world, so most of the religions of the world are cultural religions. In other words, they're religions that have been developed in order to fit the culture in which they originated. Christianity is different. Christianity is is something that has it does affect whatever culture into which it comes because it has a solid foundation that applies, and we're going to talk about this more as we go on, but it has a solid foundation that applies. It has something to give to each culture in which it comes. So it, mm -hmm. it does change the culture, but it's because the church stays the church that it has something to give to the culture or to say to the culture. Yep, yep, exactly. Now we're going to bring in a different word here and talk about its bearing on the topic of politics. Tell us what the doctrine of vocation is and why that's important to this discussion on culture, politics, and faith. Well, the, the doctrine of vocation is, is basically the idea that God has given to each one of us particular gifts. And, and if you go back to that illustration that I used earlier with when we are brought to faith, God could call us home to heaven and that would be the end of it. He, we would receive that spiritual uh, sacred kingdom that he wants us to be a part of, but he doesn't. He gives us gifts and he desires to use those gifts in our daily interactions with the people around us. And the way that uh, Luther, for example, described the doctrine of vocation is that we are masks of God. In other words, you don't see God. God is invisible. But you do see your your God working through your neighbor. You see God when the, the garbage man comes by and collects your garbage on, on Tuesday morning. You see God when the mailman drops off the mail in your mailbox. You see God when the plumber comes and fix the leak in, in your basement. So God works through the gifts that he has given to individuals, whether that be a believer or an unbeliever. There's a vocation that he has given to serve your neighbor. And so the, the way that the doctrine of vocation fits into the topic of the two kingdoms is that it, it shows us that we as Christians who have been redeemed and, and made a part of that sacred kingdom now have an opportunity to live that kingdom out and to bring that kingdom to others through the gifts that God has given to us, through the things that, that we do on a daily basis. For you, that would be as a, as a father as a husband, as a pastor, if you're involved in secular organizations, you know, there's different ways that the Lord gives us gifts to be able to serve others in this life, to be a light to the world around us and to, to proclaim his, his word of truth. And, and so that fits in the two kingdoms. We're, we're members of the sacred, but we live it out in the secular, pointing people to Christ. So that the doctrine of vocation is really the key in appropriately crossing over between yes, those two kingdoms. Exactly. And uh, that that's we talked about the separation of church and state, correct? But most of the time with the separation of church and state, no one ever talks about what the crossover right. is. But we know we know that politics has an impact on our faith and faith has an impact on our politics vocation is so critical and key but as you mentioned as a, as you described to helping us understand where those two connect to one another in the appropriate way right Mo and so we'll, we'll be using that thought as we move forward in this series on on the christian and politics is keeping that thought in mind of vocation i think even going further mark most people would say 
that using that idea of separation of church and state that there is to be absolutely no crossover between those two things they have to be completely separate you keep your faith private and whatever you do in in the public s sphere that should be completely separated from your faith and and that that just it it's not practical it's not realistic yeah yeah yeah. Now we know we know you know that can be taken to the extreme. We don't want our public institutions becoming the church. Right. But yes, you're right. It's it's unrealistic to think that our faith will not have an impact or push us in a certain direction on what we want to do in the secular areas. Right. And so vocation helps us understand how to enter that. Now here's another thought here. One one resource we've used in our study on this topic from a Lutheran perspective. This resource had an interesting quote here on politics. It said that the Lutheran perspective on politics is profoundly real realistic. What is, what is meant by that, profoundly real realistic? One of the things that happens when you, you go back up to those first three views that we talked about with liberal theology, social theology, and hermit theology is, is that there's this idea of the, the possibility, especially in connection with the social theology, of a, a utopia here on earth. You know, if, if only the church can change the culture, everything will be perfect. And what we realize is that that's, that's not possible. That's not realistic. We live in a world of sin. And so the, the doctrine of the two kingdoms is profoundly realistic in the sense that we realize that it doesn't matter whether you're talking about communism or socialism or fascism or capitalism, there's going to be problems with every single one of those views or perspectives. Somebody's always going to be there to take advantage of the situation or the system for their own best interest. And so what the doctrine of the two kingdoms does as it presents this this view of the Christian being part of the sacred and the secular at the same time is it views it from a very realistic understanding that there are going to be problems in every culture that needs to be addressed through the absolute truth of God's word that does not change and it applies to every single culture or system in different ways but with the same foundation. So it's profoundly realistic in that particular sense. And it's it's profoundly applicable too, I'd say, because the Lutheran perspective on politics shifts the person from wanting to pin all their hopes and dreams and desires on a worldly institution. Right. You know, if, if, if you and your faith are, we talked about the tumultuousness of our current political climate in the United States, if you feel yourself being too directed and attached to those worldly institutions of government, whatever whatever you may believe in politics, doesn't matter. If you're too attached to that, though, mm -hmm. the biblical perspective shows you've you got a blind spot there. You're, you're pinning too much hope on mankind because part of the realistic aspect of a biblical understanding of politics is that no worldly government is the solution. Right. There are some that are better than others and ones that we may prefer based on Christian principles, but we should not be pinning our hopes to that. And and that's something that we're going to get into in future podcasts to, to make this a little bit more personal. And where we're going with this is as we take a look at, for example, the, the parties that we have in our own government, that none of those parties are perfect. They all have their own faults and problems. What is a Christian do, going to do, though? They're going to look at at what those groups have to offer, how they present themselves, how they compare to what God would call us to be as Christians and say, okay, which one of these lines up best with what God would want me to be and how I am to live my life out in, in a world that is full of sin. Mm -hmm. Moving on to our next thought is that is morality. Morality being how we define what is right and wrong. And obviously that's going to come in in both faith and politics. Many of the things that people believe about politics in particular go back to some sort of aspect of what they believe to be moral or immoral. So taking the topic of morality, whose business is it? Is that the church's business or the state's business? Because that's where one of those areas where we see a dividing line on church and politics. And this, I think, goes back to 
one of the most basic misconceptions that we have in this particular topic because most people would answer that question and say, well, that's the role of the church, right? They're the ones who say this is right and this is wrong. That's the way people view the church. Well, you know, you're, you're too, you're too, um, you're too specific or you're too regimented or, you know, harsh. All of these different words that are used to describe the church because they have a certain system of morality. The problem is it's not the church that enforces morality. If somebody breaks one of the Ten Commandments, you don't have the church out there throwing people in the jail or putting them to death. Well, you have in the past. Well, should. okay, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that is the true. Has done sure. that in the past, but so, you shouldn't be but, doing that. But that does go back to the fact that the Lord says that that the the church. The sacred does not operate using the sword. Now, you're right. It has. The Inquisitions and others throughout yeah. history where they have gone beyond what their authority was. Yeah. But it is Which, which the, was an egregious confusing of the two kingdoms. Absolutely. During that yeah. time when the church became the state, that was a big problem. But from a, from a scriptural perspective, morality is the job of the state not the job of the church. The church can say this is right and this is wrong, but it does not have the power to enforce that in in the same way that the state does. Now the state does have the responsibility. You look at Romans 14. Paul says that the government does not bear the sword in vain. Now that's the sword, the sword of judgment, of authority, discipline, putting people in jail, taking their lives if necessary under capital punishment. That's the job of the state. So What's the implication of this? If you if you realize that it's the actually the state that has the responsibility of of legislating morality, then you look at issues that are that are highly contested in our society today. For example, the whole issue of abortion. It's the it's the government's job to protect life. It's the government's job to protect terrorists from coming in, taking the lives of others, or murderers. It's also the job of the government to protect the life of those who are not yet born out of concern. And there are all kinds of, of secular scientific studies that demonstrate the results of abortion just from a, a financial perspective on a government. Think about what's happened in China, not just with the, the recent virus that's going on, but the, the legislating of how many children they can have and how that has had an impact on their society and will over the future. The government has that right and that responsibility to protect life. Mm -hmm. So it's the government's role, not not the church's. But how does how does morality fit in from the church's perspective? Because obviously it it plays a part there in some degree. Well, I think what we're dealing with is morality is something that is universally applicable. So it's usually the church that reminds people what the moral law is and what it applies to everybody but it's the church it's the government's role to enforce that in its society mm -hmm. so when this goes back to our previous question when a government isn't doing what it is supposed to be doing christians have the right and the responsibility to stand up and say this is not right this is not what is morally acceptable not just because i'm a christian but because of what god has put inside me the natural knowledge of god and the natural knowledge of right and wrong that is what our standard is that god has given so the church does have an influence on on reminding government authorities of what that responsibility is so in a religiously pluralistic society, meaning with multiple religions like the one that we have, arguing for morality is not imposing one's religious view on another because morality ultimately, if it is truly morality, has to go back to something that is absolutely true or false for any demographic of people. Correct. And that, that's, it's important to understand as we, again, traverse the two kingdoms. Correct. And and so there are some there are some – some religions that would have differences in connection with specific aspects of morality, but many of those religions, even the religions of the world, still have that natural knowledge of what is that is wrong to steal, that it's wrong to commit adultery. You know, so there is that basic platform that every religion, to one degree or another, understands. They recognize those things that are universally applicable. Yeah. And if you if you had to have a universal religion in a culture in order to establish morality you'd have to have everybody believe right. the same thing but the very fact that we've been able 
to establish natural civil laws based on moral principles in our pluralistic society shows that it's not imposing one's religion. Right. But that's often what's used right. against a Christian standing up in the secular realm is that you can't bring religions religion into this. Right. Well, here's one of those things where even religion touches on the natural law that we know in our hearts that isn't really necessarily a religious thing, well, but it, it's just something that's known. And here, here would be the difference, Mark, in a situation like that. For me to come in the public square and say, you must believe in Jesus, that's one thing. That would be imposing my religion on someone else. I can say, you know, Jesus, Jesus is the true God, and He invites you to 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 follow Him, uh, to receive what He offers to you. But but for us to deal with morality, which is universal, you know, that is something that is for every every generation, every human being on the history of the face of this planet. That's different. So there's where, again, the church and the and society, there are things that blend between the two. Our last point for this podcast, uh, part one here, comes back again to the well, where we started with the doctrine of the two kingdoms. And you mentioned this before with the with the aspect of God being people being like the masks of God. Uh, but the doctrine of the two kingdoms teaches us that essentially God is hidden in ordinary everyday life. Explain what is meant by that. Well, like I mentioned earlier with that idea of the doctrine of vocation, and you mentioned early on that the doctrine of vocation does lay a foundation for the two kingdoms. What God does is he He uses us with the individual roles and responsibilities that he gives us in this life in order to serve our neighbor. And so God is hidden. He works through you. He works through me. He works through the, the neighbor across the street in order to, to provide and to give blessings to the people on this earth. Think about there's this, uh, there's this false teaching within Christianity of the rapture, you know, this idea that mm -hmm. Jesus is going to return again and all of the believers are going to be taken. Imagine, imagine what would happen if, boom, just like that, all of the believers were gone. Can you see see the, the result and how huge of an impact that would play on, on a society? Or or flip it around. You know, there are some people that would say, oh, you know, that, that, would, that would be a tragedy because Christians live out their lives and, and they're good people. But what happens if all of a sudden, boom, God takes all of the unbelievers? If all of the unbelievers are gone, who's going to do your taxes? You know, who's who's going to take out the garbage? All of these, the ways that God uses even unbelievers in order to serve others in vocation, they don't even realize that they're doing it, but God is working through them to provide for their neighbor. And so God is hidden in all of these different relations. He, he's, he's hidden and he serves your wife through you. He serves you through your wife. He serves your children through you and your wife. All of these ways in which God is hidden in the individual relationships of our life, whether that be as a parent or a, par a parent or a child, a husband or a wife, whether it be a, a worker, an employee, an employer. Peter discusses this at great length when he deals with these roles that God has given to us in our individual lives and how we live the sacred in the secular in this everyday life until finally the Lord does call us out of this world to be a part of that sacred with him in heaven. Yeah. Well, I, we've reached the end here of our first podcast on the Christian in politics, and, and our topic for today was the two kingdoms. So we hope that those listening were able to gain a better grasp of how the Bible describes the secular and the sacred kingdom for the Christian and the expectations that God has in each. And as we were wrapping up there, Nathaniel, I couldn't help but think of uh, Jesus standing before Pilate and Pilate saying, what kind of kingdom do you have? You're a king. Uh, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate just never got to that point where he could understand the nature of Jesus' kingdom from both a secular and a sacred perspective. And although, you know, we're not saying that the church is, is the same today as, as it was back when Christ was on this earth, but we are the kingdom of God here on earth in a very specific way, though. And when we talk about politics, when we talk about faith, let's use the Bible and, and what God has said about both of those kingdoms. He doesn't just talk about the sacred in the Bible. He talks about the ordinary everyday life as well. And like you said, he can be found in those ordinary everyday things, uh, perhaps in a different way than the sacred, but 
he can be found nonetheless. So let us uh, not fall into the same result as, as Pilate and wonder in speculation of what the kingdom of God is really about, but use the word of God as we navigate politics, as we navigate faith, and see how he puts us in both realms, in the secular and in the sacred. We thank our listeners for tuning in to our podcast today. Find more resources uh, on burdenblessing.org and also tune in again to the next part uh, of our politics podcast schedule. Uh, thank you again for listening and the Lord go with you in the coming week. We hope that you will join us next week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast. Our goal is always to bring you the whole counsel of God. Until next time, go in the strength of the Lord and preach the word.